Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Fossiltz. I serve as the board administrator for the Texas State Board of Social Worker Examiners. I'd like to begin with calling the roll. Chair Brumley? Present. Ms. Andrade? Present. Thank you. Ms. Uh, De La Pena? Present. Thank you. Ms. Dollinger? Present. Mr. Dollinger? Present. Ms. Pryor? Present. Uh, Ms. Rogers indicated that she could not attend today, and I do not see her. Ms. Science Davila? Present. Thank you. Ms. Swartz? Present. And Ms. Tatum? Present. We do have a quorum. I'll turn the meeting over to Chair Brumley. All right. Thank you all, all for joining us today. Um, we will call the meeting of the Texas State Board of Social Worker Examiners um, to order at about 1.02. So item number one was called the meeting to order. Item number two, discussion and possible action to reelect and replace public member delegate to the Texas Behavioral Health Executive Council per the Texas Occupations Code 507-051 Executive Council. Membership, Aja Rogers, whose term shall expire February 1, 2024. So we have three new, we have three public, we have two new public members. Um, are they Miss Delapena and Miss Pryor? Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. And Miss Rogers has joined us. Thank you, Miss Rogers. Good to see you. Oh, hey, Miss Rogers. Glad you're here. So, um, the the process in the past has been that the 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 Behavioral Health Executive Council Board has representatives from each of the member boards, one being a public member and one being a professional member. And historically, the chair of the board, the member boards serve as the professional member, and then a public member is elected from when, from within the board to serve on that. Ms. Rogers has um, done that for us for the past couple of years, and um, I would open the floor now to... Uh, anyone who would like to be recognized and possibly considered um, as the new public member for the BHEC board. The meetings, Daryl, we have, there's three a year? Yes, sir. There's three. three meetings a year. The first one will be this coming up February 20th. February 20th. February 20th um, would be the first meeting that you could attend. You are able to attend Zoom or in person. Correct. Um, so uh, take that into consideration. So would any of the three public members uh, want to make offer to be considered? Yes, I will. <laughs> Ms. Pryor? Okay. Uh, Ms. Pryor has made notice that she would like to be considered. Uh, Ms. Pryor and it is, is one of the new members. Um, so, so welcome to the, to the mm -hmm. Texas State Board of Social Work Examiners. Um, I would open that for discussion. Any members have any questions of Ms. Pryor? No. Um, all right. Hearing none, seeing none from Zoom, uh, I would call for a motion. Make a motion. Okay. To accept Ms. Pryor. Have a motion to uh, uh, nominate Ms. Pryor by uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, Dollinger. Ryan Dollinger. Need a second? A second. Okay. Have a second by Ms. Andrade and Ms. Tatum. So all those in favor of electing Ms. Pryor to the Behavioral Health Executive Council Board, please signify by raising your right hand saying aye. 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 So you, you are now elected to that board, Ms. Pryor. So see you on the 20th. Um, <laughs> um, during, during roll call, um, Sarah Fossholtz did, we, we do note that we do have some new members. We have uh, Karina Della Pena, who is joining us as a new public member. Um, we have Ms. Pryor, who is joining us as a public member. We have uh, Leanne Tatum, who is joining us as an LBSW, and Ryan Dollinger, who's joining us in the LCSW mm -hmm. role. Um, so we, we now again have a complete board. So thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Um, moving on, agenda item three, board review and possible action regarding appeals and applications of licensure denials, including... Uh, Janique Sneed, also known as Janique Rogers. That information is contained in board member packets. You had opportunity to review that. Um, any input, Patrick, anybody on this? I think Attorney Bridges was the oh, attorney lead Bridges? attorney okay. on it. And also, I should let you know that Miss Sneed is in attendance. She's raised her hand. Okay. So first, I'd like to recognize John Bridges, if he would like to give, attorney, attorney John Bridges, to give information. 
Uh, yes. Uh, during criminal uh, standard criminal history review, a charge popped up out of Mississippi uh, entitled uh, exploitation of a vulnerable adult, which I thought was fairly close to one of the charges we've got on our uh, practice uh, within the standard practice. So I thought it should be reviewed as to whether or not it qualifies as a reason to exclude. Okay. Um, any, any further details on that review? Tony Bridges about I do not I do not have the offense report all I have is the actual order uh it is a misdemeanor uh she served a uh a, a probation but it's one where she didn't actually have to go to a probation officer so I'm thinking they just had her do it by letter uh her story uh, I will let her tell but other than that I don't actually have much details other than the actual title of exploitation of a vulnerable adult. Okay. Legally, does that meet our Texas definition that says we shall not license or can you say? Uh, it only has to be substantially equivalent. And I was questionable on that. I don't know that it does, but I still thought it might use your review. Okay. For the board's consideration, I think Chair Bromley was referring to the Chapter 108 that the statute requires the board to revoke, and I'll let Attorney Patrick address. Right, and so so this thankfully isn't a 108 where it says shall deny. This is a a may deny uh, where it's where it's a conviction that may relate to the practice of social work. Okay, so it may be the grounds for denial. So it was really something that staff looked at and said, well, staff can't automatically approve this. This is something that needed to be reviewed by the board. So again, it's a, they can, the board can approve, the board can deny, or the board can go middle ground and say eligibility order based on this previous conviction. We think there's may, there needs to be some terms or conditions for the issuance of the license. So there's other pathways to go, but it's a conviction that looks like it may fall under what is on the, the, the um, things that relate to the practice okay. like we i think on on our rule on the rule the social work rule that talks about it it's um you know violations are about injury to a child elderly per individual those sorts of things and reporting injury to a child and elderly that sort of stuff so that's that's where our thinking was on that okay all right thank you attorney patrick um let's hear from miss sneed miss Steed, can you unmute Hello, go. can you hear me? We yes. can. All right, good morning, um, board. Is that the right address? I don't know. <laughs> well, good morning. Yes. Board. Um, um, can you see me? Or I'll just, you just can, like, okay. No, we, see you, we don't we can see hear you, you, but we hear you. Okay, um, well, I'm Jenny Sneed. And yes, I'm here to talk on behalf of the National uh, Practitioner Report that was given, as well as the um, background um, that, sh that saw my charge. Um, this all start, uh, stemmed from um, my mother's nursing home reporting me. Um, originally, I got offered a job to come to Louisiana to um, work and my mother decided to be with her boyfriend in Mississippi. Um, she got ill and was in a diabetic coma and which um, she was later on put in a nursing home. During that time, um, her nursing home is eight hours away from me. Um, so I wanted her to be close. Um, she And also I was concerned about her, um, how she looked every time I went every other week. And I just wanted her to just be close to me so I could, you know, have eyes on her. During that time, I told the nursing home that I would like to do the process. Um, and then I went ahead and commenced with going with all the other um, nursing home that was in Louisiana that was closer to me. The nursing home was not responsive. Um, so um, this after need, the, of, the Louisiana nursing home or the Mississippi nursing home was not responsive. The Mississippi that uh, okay. nursing home that my mother was in, they were not responsive to me. So um, I felt helpless, and I did not know how to advocate other than the monies that was you know, owed to her. So I told them when I went to visit them 
that I will be withholding um, her payment to the nursing home until we get this resolved, which is totally, I've come to find out was totally illegal. <laughs> um, they did report me to the, I'm sorry guys, <laughs> they did report me to the uh, attorney, um, district attorney in, um, and they wanted um, to, I cooperated with everything that they asked for. And um, I told them what I did. Um, and I went through the motions of the court case. During this time, I'm still advocating for my mom. <laughs> I'm still trying to get her closer to me. And we were eventually um, able to get her um, in a nursing home closer to me in 2008, but unfortunately she passed. And I'm still going through, I was still going through the court case. Um, just to give you a time reference, the reporting happened in 2006, um, 2016, I'm sorry. I didn't even get indicted or any type of charges placed on me uh, I, until 2019, in which I turned myself in um, once they did so. And then I didn't even get my my uh my case resolved until 2022. Um, and when that happened, after my mama's passing, um, the it was the worst thing in my life. But the only thing that really came to mind during my grief was how compassionate that the social workers were at the nursing home, the receiving nursing home, as well as the nursing home at the hospital where she passed. And that's where I found my life in social work. I enrolled into, um, she passed in 2018. I enrolled into my master's program in 2009, uh, 2019 and I finished in 22, just about the time where um, the case was finalized. I, I say I've worked in, um, because of this, because of what happened, it's bittersweet, but I did find my passion. And because of this, I went into um, my first job in human services and social work was at the housing authority, where I housed over 75 people in um, Section 8 in public housing. At the current agency that I'm at right now, we do a sort of community treatment where um, I started as a housing specialist um, and I place people in nursing homes, but advocated for their needs. I also um, house, um, our population is severely mentally ill clients. So I have housed and advocated and um, made sure that they have a place in the community. Um, I Once I... I, um, here I, I'm sorry, um, once I did, um, get my licensure here in Louisiana, I went ahead and, um, I was able to get promoted to a crisis manager as well as, um, I was, once I got my license and L my LMSW, I did become a, um, substance abuse counselor and now I'm a mental health professional. So, Ms. Snead, are you are you moving to Texas to practice, or are you just going to go across state lines and you're asking for Louisiana and Texas licensure? I'm moving to Texas in three weeks. <laughs> okay. And with all this being said, and I'm sorry if I'm long winded. I am a wife of a co a police officer. I'm a mother. I'm a social worker and a veteran, and my moral compass is intact. I have a a lack of judgment when I did that. Um, with that nursing home, but it was only to bring my mother closer. And I do apologize. Well, I do feel remorseful. And I felt like I, if I had not the knowledge of that was very much illegal, I would not have done it. I would find other means, but um, I did not know, but I know now. And I've helped millions, well, not millions, hundreds of others. So I, one question, out of the criminal charge, they were basing that on you were somehow put in charge of your mother's funds as like guardian or something, correct? Yes. yes. And so you thought uh, the way a person handles in life, well, if I'm not getting the service I want, I can negotiate by withholding payment. Yes, but that was when that uh, when they charged me. 
<laughs> but unfortunately, <laughs> it wasn't your money you were withholding. It was her money. And that's what got you. Yeah, that's what got me. And um, ignorance doesn't remove you from getting charged. I, I definitely totally understand that. Um, but I, I didn't I didn't know at that particular time. And I was just I didn't have anything to help me in that particular time other than monetary value over my mother. And that's what I got the charge for. Um, the The arrest record is not expunged, but um, my misdemeanor is. But um, at the end, all I can say is I'm a social worker and I've been doing this and I just want to hold the le legacy of my mother. And this is why I'm doing it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Need, and thank you thank for you so much. representing yourself. So so board, you have heard. Does anybody have any questions of Miss Sneed? I have a couple of questions. I have a couple of questions from Mr. Dullinger. Uh, how did you respond on the application when you made the application? <laughs> did you tell us that you had this or did you say that oh you had no criminal history? I definitely responded. I didn't know exactly the questions were kind of tricky. So I just put something, uh, said that um I had some charges against me. Um, about my criminal history, and I did attach my um, disposition of the misdemeanor to my application. Okay. And have you made restitution to the facility? Yes, I have paid my dues and everything. I did not have to do a probation, um, the regular probation. Um, I just had to do it, just pay my fees. I hope that answered your question. I'm sorry. Any other questions? All right. Hearing none. So in, in, in my understanding, we have, we have three options here. We can approve the application to move forward. We can approve it with conditions or we can deny it. So I would entertain a motion for one of those options. I'll put on the motion. Ms. Tatum, you're recognized. Which motion? With conditions. What conditions? Um, that would need to be further discussed as far as. So with conditions, it would be like she would have six months of supervision while she was practiced. We could ask her to do some continuing education. I was I thinking know, supervision and CEUs. Okay. So we have a motion. Her arrest was in 2018. For um, approval, final. Patrick, with conditions. Yeah, it would be. So what we would do is offer an eligibility order, and then that would be um, something that could be signed off on if she agrees to it. If, if she doesn't agree to it, then we would have to deny the application right. and, and go through the denial process. But if it's going the, the middle ground option of, of not straight denial or straight acceptance, um, We'll, we'll draft up an eligibility order. We just need to know the exact terms. And so it sounds like there's a, a continuing education you want done before the issuance of the license, or we can issue the license and then she can do it within a certain period of time. And what type of education, how many numbers, that sort of stuff. I guess that's something I feel the board would need to discuss. Um, so we could do, you could have um, CEs related to um, exploitation. exploitation of, of, clients things like mm -hmm. that three hours six hours above and beyond i mean like an additional 10 hours that's a lot or, okay that's what i need y'all yeah. to input yeah. as well so. yeah yeah we, we typically do something between three and six hours okay. of continuing education um she's recently done the jurisprudence exam i would assume she would have to she had to yeah. get this far to even apply yeah so uh three hours of continuing education related to exploitation uh, would you like that? Would you like that to be that, look, the license issued and she has six months to do that or do that and then issue the license? I would do that and then issue the license. Okay. So complete what's the time frame usually on supervision. how long they're in supervision? So we, we had, I mean, it's kind of open-ended, but six months is used typically the minimum that I've seen um, up to whatever. You guys normally recommend um there's not I, I mean i'll just say the 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 conduct in question that kind of brought it to the board here today is not one it's not a concern about substandard practice or her professional judgment it's just she made a mistake in life and so um to me i 
just Daryl, I don't see the need to put her under supervision or a practice monitor for any period of time because her professional judgment's not in question. Um, <clears throat> and she's also going to be an LMSW that's not going to be an independent practice. Yeah, right? so, yeah. I mean, yeah. she's going to be based in a in a team environment anyway. So, um, you know, what what I I think what I would say if you if y'all want to do the CE, just say. Uh, I would actually say give her the license and say within 90 days you got to complete 10 hour or whatever it is. Yeah. I'm sorry, whatever, whatever it was. Okay. Uh, give her the license within these X number of days, 90 days. You got to complete six hours of continuing education in blah. Okay. And then if she doesn't do that, which I'm not worried about her doing it, but if she if she weren't to do it, then we would open up another complaint for failure to follow a board order, and that would be a pretty serious violation at that point. Okay. But that just okay? based okay. off what we're hearing from her here, I. I don't really have any. Okay. So we have a, a, an agree. We, we've agreed to a motion that is um, six hours of CEs related to exploitation of clients and maybe setting boundaries. They can be mm -hmm. three and three mm -hmm. um, and issue the license and then her complete these CEs within a 90 day time frame. So all those, Oh, I need a second on that. It, Chair Brown, may I just for one sake, Miss Sneed, can you hear me? Okay. You're on mute, Miss Need. Now you are. I definitely can. Um, yeah. Are you are you kind of listening to what the board's talking about? Yes, I am. Okay. I Is am. that are are you in a I guess are you in a financial position where if we ordered six additional continuing education hours within the following ninety days, can can you handle that? Is that gonna are you financially are you able gonna be gonna be able to do that? I don't need to know your finances in that time frame. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I will be moving. It will be a crunch, but I'll get it done. I mean, whatever it takes, I just want to be able to do what I need to do. Okay. Well, I just, what we don't want to do is offer a solution to this and it be a solution that doesn't work for you. And then we're all back here again at the next board meeting dealing with a bigger problem at that point. So I'm just trying not to set you up to fail. Understood. And thank you so much. Um, yes, I, I am financially capable of of doing the CEUs. Yes. Okay. okay. And considering okay. that you're moving, is the 90 day time frame problematic? Would, if the board was willing, would the additional time? Um. Yes. Uh, uh, I will say the additional. Well, I will do it as soon as possible. <laughs> but um, yeah, the 90 days is fine. I just want to. Um, it depends on if y'all gonna allow me to. Are y'all going to give the license first? Is that the conversation or after I do the CEUs? You you would get the license and then the, the CEs would be done with uh, the license application would move forward and you would get, you would need to turn the CEs in within 90 days. Yes. Then yes. Cause yes, uh, I will be uh, able to do this. Are we talking about an eligibility order here or some type of uh, warning yeah. letter? No, that's no. what Patrick called it an eligibility order. Okay. Yeah. And that, uh, it, that'll take me hopefully within a week to draw that up, get it to you, have you review it, get it back. And then um, Daryl's really quick about reviewing things. So I'm thinking no more than a week after that. As soon as we get the eligibility order fully enacted, then after that, things would move forward. And you could crunch out the hours online fairly quickly. Awesome. Okay. Do I have a second to that motion? I'll make a second. I have a second for Mr. Dollinger. All right. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand, saying aye. 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 Motion does carry. So, Ms. Sneed, you will be um, moving forward in the licensure process for Texas. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And, Ms. Sneed, I just wanted to make sure. Um, when attorney Bridges said the order's fully enacted, I believe that means that you will need to sign the order and return it. And then our office, the executive director would need to sign it in yes. order to, uh, put it into effect. So that's what he means when fully enacted. So it takes some time for the mail and transmission of those documents. So be um, on the lookout for that. Yes, ma'am. Thank not, you. Do not start doing the CEs until after the order is fully enacted. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Need. Thank you. All right. 
Thank you, board. All right, moving on to agenda item number four, board review and possible action regarding agreed orders to be executed by the board. I know of none. Yeah, they, they're, I don't think there were any in our packet. So, all right, agenda item four, I mean five, board review and possible action regarding contested cases from State Office of Administrating Hearings, otherwise known as SOA. I know of none. Patrick, John, nope. Kenneth, I don't think nope. we have any. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Agenda item six, uh, report of agreed orders executed by the council's executive director. So those were in your packet. If you have any questions, I'll try to address your questions. They were all listed. And for new board members, um, these are these are orders that um, a committee of the board has met with and made a made a finding on. And and then the executive director sends those out for approval. So you had opportunity to read those. All right. Uh, number seven are cases that were reported cases dismissed by the executive director. And that report was in your materials. If I can answer any questions, I'll try to do so. Any questions from the board? All right. Number eight, status report of quarterly enforcement case activities. That's Again, in the meeting materials, if I can answer any questions. Any questions about what's been going on as far as enforcement over the last quarter? Mm -hmm. Nope. All right. Number nine, report from committee chairs. So A is ethics committee. We did not have any meetings during the last quarter. Uh, B, licensing standards and qualifications. Um, the chair of that is Ms. Science Davila. Did y'all have a, a meeting? We also have not had any meetings. Okay. Uh, then we have professional development. Uh, we didn't we didn't do anything this past nope. quarter. And then D is Miss Andrade for rules. Did y'all have anything, Katie? In the last quarter? No, we didn't. Okay. So no, sir. Smooth running organization. So number 10, <laughs> discussion and possible action concerning public comment on proposed rules published in the September 22nd, 2023 Texas Register and recommendations to the Texas Behavioral Health Executive Council concerning possible adoption of proposed changes in Texas Administrative Code 22 TAC, including A781404, recognition as a council-approved supervisor and the supervision process to clarify the fee arrangement between supervisors and supervisees. Um, we had public comment that was open. Everything is done now, as far as I can tell. Um, so today, um, if we agenda item number 10, A and B, if we approve those, those will then move up to the BHEC meeting on February 20th and approval from that. What is it? 30 days after that? that it goes into effect or not it's making that up it's 20 days 20. after submission to the secretary of state okay so the meeting's the 20th the staff will need some time to prepare an adoption package and submit it to the secretary of state so the secretary of state may need a day or two to get it posted posted okay um so any discussion about um 781404 uh item 10a um that really just kind of clarified that if this is my breakdown country understanding of it. If you are an, an LCSWS and you are employed and you're being paid in your employment to supervise, then you don't get extra compensation from supervisees. That's, that's the, the basic cut of what you see in yellow there. So um, I guess some folks were double dipping. <laughs> we've, we've asked that that not happen anymore can i have i have a question any input or questions yes this question sure. so if you're a supervisor in an organization as far as like administratively okay does that impact your ability to charge it, for example like i i'm a supervisor in an organization you're an lcsw let's, let's clarify yeah, yeah. supervisor okay. okay okay that's what my question yeah. was so if my employer is reimbursing me to provide supervision to people, I cannot charge them. That is correct. Okay. That's what we're saying. But if I'm supervising them in my organization, but my employer is not reimbursing me, you can charge them. That is correct. Okay. Yes. okay. Or even extrapolate it out. If you, if you have, if you're working at, 
Dollinger, you you have this own business, okay? Mm-hmm. But yet, it, within that or within that, you you work for Austin State Hospital. Right. They pay you to supervise, and you supervise folks. But you do it independently outside of your job. Mm-hmm. We're not we're not two different blocking things. you there because right. you can go out and do it on your own in the public. But at at your agency where you're drawing a salary, we're saying you can't charge those people, right? Okay. That work at Austin State Hospital if that's where you're going to. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Doesn't preclude a side hustle. Yeah. 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 You, can, you can have yeah. a side. Yeah. And I had an inquiry. So if I'm an LCSW with supervisor status in my own private practice and I hire an LMSW and we have a deal that their client, they see their client, I'm supervising them and I get a percentage of the revenue they generate. I'm thinking that's compensation. So I could not charge that LMSW in addition to the cut that I get from the revenue that they generate. Is that how the attorneys would interpret that? I don't know. Attorneys interpret. <laughs> <laughs> I think it goes. Oh. Can I just make a comment on that? So I would, per, I, <coughs> in a private practice, I would charge a 60 40 split or 70 30 or whatever to anybody who works for me, whether I provided supervision or not if I owned the practice. So I don't know if that's an unfair. But put- would you charge, if, if I'm working, if I'm LMSW and I come to work for you mm-hmm. and you're providing me supervision and and Leanne is also there, but she's not under supervision, we still 70, would 30, 60, charged. 40. We, we, we both, I'm not doing more because I'm getting supervision. Correct. Okay. Correct. And I think that would be okay. Yeah. Correct. I would charge everybody a percentage to because you're working in my group practice does that make sense that that's more like that's more like a, a fee for the business opportunity right. and to cover your overhead and your operational expenses they're not actually paying you to provide supervision to them right now i guess if 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 you'd have to be careful there as the contracting parties to make sure it was clear this you're not getting supervision from me you're just getting the privilege to practice with me under Kind of under my umbrella here, the organization perk of right. working here, right? Yeah, or you say if you want me to supervise you, it'll be X amount over and above that seventy thirty, or you have a separate financial arrangement for that. I think as long as you're clear on that, I think you could, I think that was fine. That's that's an unusual circumstance. That's that's unusual. I just wanted but, everyone to hear, yeah, hear that discussion. Yeah. All right. So then, agenda item. B, 10B, 781-501, requirements for continuing education to allow field instructors to claim up to 10 hours CE per renewal period. Um, rules committee determined to present option to the board. So, a little history. Um, this was a rule for years. It, it slipped away, and now we've brought it back. It looks a little bit different. Um, we have uh, written the rule now so that an individual who provides field supervision to a student seeking a social work degree can get hour for hour based on semester credit hour. So if someone is, is enrolled in three semester credit hours in a semester, that field instructor could receive three hours of CEs for supervising during that same semester up to 10 hours per renewal period. (coughs) So, um, if they earn more than that, we still have that carryover option, but that's a whole different topic. But that that's that's there. Um, if, as stated, if these rules go into effect, that they would be in effect for the basically the spring semester of 2024 and for renewals coming up at, from this point forward. So, uh, any questions about the uh, rule as far as? continuing education for field instruction. Mm-hmm. Thank you all for working on that rules committee. So, all right. So we have two, we have a and B here. We can take them together. Uh, we need a motion to approve these to be moved up to the B heck agenda. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion for Mr. Dollinger. Need a second. A second. I have a second for Ms. Pryor. All those in favor indicate by raising your hand saying, aye. Aye. Okay those will move forward all right 11 
um, discussion and possible action concerning public comment on proposed rules published in the November 17th, 2023 Texas Register and recommendation to the Texas Behavioral Health Administrative Executive Council concerning possible adoption of proposed changes in the Texas Administrative Code 22 TAC, including um, we have an A and B again. We have 781-323, technology and social work practice to clarify rules regarding telehealth across state lines. And before we move on this, I'm going to turn this over to Attorney Patrick for some explanation about the process here. Yeah, I was going to uh, make a mention that the, so all of these are recommendations to go to the council uh, at their meeting in February for final adoption. Uh, one of the things, though, that I wanted to mention is the council is considering uh, a proposed amendment to one of their rules, which is 882.23. And if that um, uh, if that amendment is adopted at that meeting, it will cause a conflict with the proposed language in this 781.323. And so there is already a rule in place that says the the council rule will trump the, the board rule. But... <clears throat> I would recommend that if you're you're wanting to move this rule forward, it would be a conditional approval that it only be adopted if the council doesn't adopt its amendment to 882.23, because if we adopt both, we're going to have to bring this back to you and amend this rule again. So I think it would be better to withdraw it if that if that rule is amended, that uh, that BHEC rule is amended. Um, and uh, if they don't amend it, then we can move forward with the adoption. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm, I'm sort of um, <clears throat> okay. What's what's the temperature of the BHEC rule? I mean, what is it looking at doing? I I the, the BHEC rule is what it's designed to do right now. Uh, the council views if you're the if the practitioner or the recipient of services, if either one is located in Texas, you have to have a license to practice in Texas. What we learned from some some hurricanes, some natural disasters that drove uh, neighboring state providers into Texas who were then wanting to deliver services back in their home state, what we learned is those people were being prevented from doing that because the way we view our licensure requirements. <clears throat> so what we did is we thought, well, how can we how can we change our rules so that we're not requiring individuals who are licensed in another state and are only here temporarily and they want to continue delivering services back in their home licensure state, what can we do to kind of get out of the way for those folks? That's what the BHEC rule does. It, it says, hey, staff, you no longer have to police out-of-state licensees who are only here temporarily, and they are only delivering services back to their home state. But there has to be some sort of declaration of disaster for that to go into No, that? no, it, okay. it's not contingent. So even if you were on vacation here from Florida and, but you, and you wanted to keep – seeing patients back in Florida. Why does that really matter to us? Because they're, you know, we don't have any jurisdiction over Floridians Yeah. and the harm, any harm that's caused is going to be caused in Florida. Let the Florida board worry about that. Uh, and as long as they don't do anything with a Texas resident or somebody here, they don't need a Texas license because the services are being delivered there. This there's two, I'm going to geek out a little bit. There are two competing views on, um, whether a license is needed. There are some states like we, um, Texas is currently where if the provider or the recipient is here, you got to have a license. The other camp says we only look to see where the services are being delivered, and in that jurisdiction is where you have to have a license. Both have arguments for and against, but in just our experience here in Texas has kind of shown us that we probably don't need to be policing those folks because we're if the harm takes place elsewhere. Somebody else is going to be better equipped to handle that harm. And so it just doesn't represent a high risk to the Texas public. And that's why the council has, has agreed to propose that rule and to really take a look at it. There hasn't been any pushback uh, on the council rule. It seems like everybody is in support of it. So I'm anticipating that that rule will actually go through. Okay. Um, you know, so we adopt this rule, Patrick, and send it up. And they adopt, and BHEC adopts their rule. Then our rule is invalid. Is that? Well, our, our rule will have a direct conflict with what the council rule okay. would would state. Currently, if this is adopted today, it wouldn't conflict with anything. I know of no Texas statute or rule that this would conflict with. Uh -huh. But the the council rule once adopted will create a conflict with this, and this It'd be won't good get for a month. 
No, well, it'll, yeah, about. Yes. It, it'll actually be, they'll actually get adopted at the same time. So oh, it'll, that's be, true. Yeah. it'll be instantly invalid, okay. basically, if they both get adopted, because both have to go to the, this rule, this social work rule has to go to the council meeting. And at the exact same council meeting, they're voting on that other rule. So depending on what happens with that council rule, this could be totally, this social work rule could be totally fine if they don't move it forward, or it could also be you know, proposed in it or, or adopted and it immediately conflict with another, another so, rule. So circle back for me now today, then what do we need to do? Well, that's what, what I would recommend is if you'd like to move the, the rule forward, I would recommend that the, the, the motion be that if the council does not adopt the, the proposed changes to 882.23, then, then, you want to adopt this rule. If the council does adopt that rule, then withdraw this rule. Take, yeah, take no action on this at the council yeah, level. Okay. Depending on how the council and then acts. they'll be put on the agenda for BHEC in that order. So they'll correct. They the count the council rule will be reached first okay. on BX agenda. So we'll know yeah, we'll yeah. know before we get to the social work rule. And then we'll just I'll make a notation. You and I can and Ms. Pryor, we can kind of tell the council look yeah. We don't need to touch it. If the council has adopted those other changes, we don't need to touch this rule. Pass, but, pass yeah, just okay. move on, move over it. Can I ask right. a question about the council rule? What's the definition of temporary? They're temporarily here. Yeah. Um. Well, we don't we don't have a definition in that. We don't have a definition. So I could be on vacation six months in Texas and mm -hmm. provide services here. No. Well. That's what it, it defines the provision of services as where the client is physically yeah. located. So as long as there's no one physically in Texas, it doesn't matter if it's a Florida resident that comes to Texas and that's the client. Once they prov start providing services to them and they're physically in Texas, then we would say that's the provision of services here. But if they are uh, a provider of vacationing here in Texas and that client is in Florida the entire time, and they're harming the person. They're causing the harm in in Florida is basically what the new rule. rule so say. if you were a snowbird and you went from Florida down to the valley for whatever reason and stayed mm -hmm. in the winter, huh. and you're a practitioner, but you kept all your clients in Colorado, mm -hmm. you're following Colorado rules. That's right. While you're in Texas, telehealth and back and forth. Yeah, and that's, that's okay. That's fine. And that would be fine under that law. One of the things, too, that that rule is sort of modeled after, I think, is SIPAC, is that, that the council is a member of. So right. for, for psychology, they look at where is the where is the patient client located, right. and that's, you know, you're using those. Because you, you start then starting to have jurisdictional conflicts where yeah. you're having to say, well, you, are you going to apply Texas mm -hmm. and Florida law at the same time? They don't always match. They actually don't <laughs> match up yeah. so always. So, yeah. Okay. It, it starts Did anybody conflicts. listen well enough to make a motion? <laughs> all right i'll try <laughs> okay. um so i'll make a motion that seven we're going to take these separate then we'll do 11a first 781 323 um i make a motion that the rule be put forward in its current form to BHEC meeting on the 20th with anticipation that if BHEC's meeting in the BHEC meeting if their new rule is approved, then this rule goes away. We'll be withdrawn. We'll be withdrawn from yeah. that meeting agenda. Okay. Yep. So there's the motion. But if it's not approved, if it's not approved, then this rule will be in effect. There you go. Okay. Yep. I need a second. And you, you need a, I'll second. Okay. Have a second from Dolores. All right. All those in favor of the motion on the table, please signify by raising your right hand or saying aye. 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 Motion does carry. Okay. Here, Bromley, there would be a, if, if it goes like that, then there would be withdrawal of the rules sent to the Texas Register. Correct. Yes. Thank you, Brenda. All right. This one's going to be easier. 11B. 781-412 examination requirement. We're, we're asking to remove the shelf life of the ASWB exam score to streamline licensing processes per December 2022 report from the Senate Special Committee to protect all Texans. Basically, we had a time frame that if you took your ASWB exam, you had to have your score presented within a certain time frame. Um, we're removing that time frame. Two years. 
it's a, it was two years. It's before. a two year window is, is the only that's your exam remained valid or acceptable to us for just two years. Yeah. And now it's now we're doing away with that window. Doing so, away with that yeah. two year window. So it's, it's open. So. And it's not a move without precedent. Two of the other boards already do it. LPC is about to do it. Um, so yeah. it's, it's and not several a new, other states already have yeah, it that way. So. It's not a new thing. Okay. So agenda item 11 B, do I have a motion to consider, um, 781 412 removing the shelf lot. I make a motion to consider. Um, who was that? Miss oh, Science Davila. I wouldn't look at uh, Miss uh, Science Davila has made a motion. Need a second. A second. Have a second from Miss Delapina. All right. Have a motion to second. All those in favor, signify by raising your hand, saying aye. Motion does carry. And to clarify, I heard that the motion was to recommend this for adoption. Is that, that is correct? correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I had it right. Yes. Yes, we will be removing the shelf line. Thank you. Agenda item 12, discussion and possible action regarding jurisprudence exam. Um, the information has been in your packets. Um, nothing real earth shattering coming from that. It's been updated. It's, it's there. Um, you have to do it. So any questions, concerns, input? All right, we'll move on. Uh, to the part B, anybody have anything they would like to see related to changes in there? Uh, I didn't see any notes or public comment this time. So, all right. Um, agenda item 13, report from the board chair concerning current challenges, accomplishments, lawsuits, interaction with stakeholders, state officials, staff, committee appointments and functions, workload of the board members, conferences, general information regarding the routine functioning of the board. I, I apologize before you get into the meat of your report. Yes. I did have a question for the board members in regard to um, the jurisprudence exam, because there were a couple of comments um, of repetitive questions regarding the fingerprint process. And there are currently six different. So the way the jurisprudence exam works, there's about 200 questions that are in a pool. And when an examinee logs on, it, it generates a random selection of about 126 of those questions. Um, six of those are about the fingerprinting process, which was brand new to uh, social work licensees when, they, when we transitioned to the council. So we wanted to make sure that as few people as possible got caught up in everything else was good to go, but we can't complete your renewal because we don't have your fingerprint based reports or everything was good to go on your application, but we can't go forward because we don't have your fingerprint based reports. Um, and a number of, of, I think there were three commenters who said enough about fingerprints. I know all about it now. So I was just going to ask if, if we want to refer this to the professional development committee, or if the board would like to remove some of these questions, maybe just keep one. They're not duplicate questions. They're about, you know, versus a, a fingerprint process for when you're getting, when you're applying for license, when you're re applying to reclassify for a license or when you're renewing. So there are nuanced questions, but they're all about the basic same process. And, and we have a, I mean, Tim Spear did a real good, question and answer how to on the website about how to about the that. fingerprinting we've we've done considerable amount of of public awareness about it and we're in a rotation now where everybody should have gone through it yes yeah. e everybody who was previously licensed and future licensed has mm -hmm. gone through the pro or will I, go through the process. i see about one inquiry a month where someone says how come my license is expired yeah because they did everything but that fingerprinting, that fingerprinting. and a year went by before they realized yeah. that something was amiss. So, and that's how it got to from delinquent to expired. I would absolutely entertain a motion to reduce that number of questions. Okay. You said there's how many now? Six. There, there are six. My only concern is that you're taking a gamble of 120 questions out of a uh, thing. Is the likelihood of, if we reduce it to one, the likelihood of getting none is high. So I would propose we cut it in half. Okay. So we have a motion to reduce it to three questions from six. Need a second. I'll second. I second it. Okay. Have a second for Ms. Tatum, Ms. Delapena. All those in favor of removing it are removing it from six questions to three. Signify by raising your hand or saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Motion does carry, so it will be reduced to three questions. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, so back to 13. I'm not going to read all that again, but um, <laughs> we've had, um, I know Sarah and I attended the Texas NASW and then went to, where'd we go? Uh, Memphis. Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee to ASWB um, since the last meeting. And uh, both conferences were uh, well attended. The NASW conference we got this year, I think we had a positive interaction with most all stakeholders. Um, folks came around, uh, didn't have any, I mean, as far as no, no, no real complaints about timeframes, timelines in general. Um, everything seemed to be running pretty smooth. So Sarah, was that your feeling? You were there much more than I was mm -hmm. at the booth. So yeah. So, we had yeah. good turnout. Yeah. Um, ASWB, the only uh, big news there was that uh, I guess this week that they've changed from Pearson View being their test provider to a company called PSI. And, and I have no zero information about how that transition is going. I haven't seen anything yet. So if no you, news is good news. Yeah, <laughs> I have. I haven't seen um, I haven't seen any. Um, corrections or workarounds from announcements from ASWB yeah, and I've not heard anything bubble up from staff or from the assistant manager uh, in regard to our inquiry volume okay. so to my knowledge it has all gone very smoothly and, and hopefully and, and it was my understanding that the PSI process is home-based you you don't go to a facility to do the test anymore. I believe that they are working. One of the reasons for the transition is because PSI could offer okay. a home-based exam. Um, they just not there. But yet. it. But I believe that there's still some uh, processes and security to work out. And so ASWB hopes to announce that in the future. Gotcha. Was my last understanding of their announcement. Okay. All right, and that's and that's uh, that's all I know of at this time for my report. So we'll move on to 14 report from the board delegates to the behavioral health executive council regarding the activities of the executive council, including council's rulemaking actions taken at its October 24th, 2023 meeting with adopted rules, proposed rules and other council updates. Um, I attended the meeting uh, via zoom. They had it. Um, they, it, it was a, a, a live opportunity meeting. Um, nothing Nothing out of the ordinary. Things went smooth as far as I could tell. Daryl, any anything from your end on that that meeting that day? Mm, no, I can't I can't remember anything significant off the top of my head. It's pretty pretty simple. There's a summary in the meeting materials of yeah. adopted rules and proposed rules and some other updates, but um I don't know that there's any Okay. Um there's a list of significant BHEC achievements. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't have forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we well, I mean, one of the things that over the past year, I, I do remember, Daryl, was that the number of legislative inquiries went drastically down. Oh, it's plummeted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was the there was the transition months that it was awful. Yeah. And then it just, yeah, you know, let it us, bottomed out. Let us kick it up into higher gear and we'll get there. Yeah. So, yeah. It looked like that's what happened. So. All right, agenda item 15, report from the board administrator concerning operations, organization, and staffing, workload, processing, statistical information, status of rulemaking, customer service accomplishments, inquiries, challenges, media, legislative, stakeholder contracts and concerns, special projects, and general information regarding the routine functioning of the program. Sarah. So as, as Chair Bromley mentioned, um, we were in uh, at the National Association of Social Work uh, Texas Chapter Conference in Galveston in your media materials. Um, is also the, a copy of the evaluations I received as a presenter. Um, I was, I think it was a 90 minute present presentation. I tried to keep it to 45 minutes of me talking and 45 minutes of me answering questions. Um, and I also staffed a table there and we had pretty good attendance. Um, um, as always, the, the people were fabulous and asked good questions. So that was good. Um, I also attended the board administrators forum on November 2nd. Um, uh, for ASWB in Memphis, as well as the delegate assembly. Um, Ms. Science Davila was our, um, she was the delegate and um, and Chair Brumley was the was the alternate delegate or some something. Indeed. So we were all there. Um, also in your, for the, for the board's uh, consideration in your meeting materials is a, 
a case regarding an Air Force spouse who was denied a Texas education counseling uh, type of licensure. It's not ours. It's not not anything with the council, but uh, Director Spinks just pointed out this is this is why some of our rules are in place so that we avoid this type of litigation. Um, so just wanted to include that in your packet for your review. I wanted to remind all applicants and licensees that when you are ex expecting a reply from the council staff, please be sure to check your spam and your junk folders. Oftentimes a government email address is routed by the recipient's uh, email filter to those junk or spam folders. And I get, um, I get a second or third question of, I never got a response and I can see that I myself responded to them. And I suspect that it went into the junk or the spam. So I'd like to um, make sure that y'all, y'all know to look there when you're expecting something from us. Um, I would like to take you on a small tour of the website to show you, show you some of the resources. From our homepage at www.bhec.texas.gov, I'll click here on the, on the homepage link so you can see where I'm at. This is our homepage. Want to remind you that the four member board names that are up in the masthead, those are actually live links. So when you click, for example, on the social work boards, name in that masthead, the quick links change on the right-hand side of the page. I'm gonna go back to the home page by clicking on Behavioral Health Executive Council. Want to bring to your attention one of our new, relatively new web pages regarding the proposed rule changes. That's the second bullet down on the quick link side. Um, it gives you a nice overview of the rulemaking process and the notification process. And down at the bottom is where you can see uh, the last BHEC meeting date, if you click on that link and opens a document that describes for you all of the rulemaking processes that happened during that meeting. And I want to bring to your attention that the table of contents is also a quick link. So if you want to look, for example, at the social work rules, you can click on the table of contents and it'll take you right to that. They're laid out in the table of contents um, with uh, for lack of a better term, council rules, which apply to all four member boards. So just because it's a council rule doesn't mean you can ignore it. It means it applies to you as well as all the other boards. And those are chapters 881 to 885. So you'll want to look at all of those. And then you can come down and click on like social work examiners and it'll pop up for you um, those rules. These two rules, as we just discussed, were published um, in the November 17th Texas Register, the public comment period closed on December 17th. So um, these are no longer live, live links for public comment, but when the council meets again on February 20th, then shortly after that meeting, there'll be another link here dated for the February 20th council meeting and all the things that happened there. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention if you're looking to give some, if you're looking to give some public comment on the rulemaking. If I scroll back up to the quick links, I want to bring to your attention under the quick link for statutes and rules. We provide as a courtesy, a consolidated rule book for all four member boards. And those rule books are in PDF form, which means they're easily searchable. You can see here in the, on the cover that it was last updated November 20th. So if you've downloaded a copy of this PDF before November 20th, there's a new version out there for you to download. I encourage you to use this uh, frequently. It's easy to search. It includes chapters 881 to 885. It includes chapter 781, which is the social work rules. And then as well as other rules such as chapter 611, which are um, regarding medical records. And we've uh, that's been traditionally a frequent a uh, violation of uh, chapter there. So just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, I think that, oh, one more thing. Also in this quick link list, the second from the bottom are email updates. Um, you can sign up to get, uh, to get a subscription service for updates from the board or from the council. Um, and you'll be informed of changes in rulemaking, changes in operations, 
uh, when the board's meeting, all of those kinds of things, I encourage everyone to sign up. It comes directly to your em email inbox. Just complete the subscription form on the web page. You'll receive an email in your email inbox and you'll need to confirm the subscription by following those prompts. And that concludes my report, unless uh, I can answer some questions for anyone. Okie dokie, that concludes my report. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, any questions from anybody on Zoom? I didn't, I didn't look up, so. Oh, none. All right. We'll move on to 16, update and discussion concerning the Social Work Interstate Compact. Daryl, any burning news? Um, no changes. No changes. It, <laughs> there won't be any changes in Texas until the ledge is yeah, back in we're, session. We're looking at 2025. Correct. At the earliest. And and is it is it my understanding it takes seven to it takes seven states to enact it? Correct. And we're at one or two that have officially one last I knew, Missouri. Missouri? Yeah, Missouri Missouri's the only one who's actually adopted. It. Correct. Okay. So Texas will look at it in 2025. I included in the board members meeting materials. Uh, I just went through the social work compact. They have a map. It's very nice to just roll over it and it tells you, for example, Missouri, and it gives you the house bill number or the Senate bill number and a link. And so in your meeting materials, there's been 14 states that have in some way reviewed or considered the Social Work Compact, Missouri, as, as Director Spink said, is the only one that's ad enacted it as a law. Um, some of these haven't had any action since last March or last April, and I don't know other states' legislative session terms or yeah. schedules. So it could be that they they died in the middle of the session, or it could be that they're not done yet. I just don't know. Um, some of them have a last action, for example, of December 26th for Utah, um, January 3rd for Vermont. So they may still have some uh, life in them and might go somewhere. So, but at if you Google social work interstate compact, you'll get that website and you can click on the link for their map and check on it anytime you like. Thank you for that, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, the, the one thing I would add, just for the the public's edification, I, I need every. It's important for the public to remember that this board, we cannot go over to the legislature and ask that the compact be presented in a bill and, and be taken up by the legislature. That is something. It's really that is the responsibility of the public. Really, you're going to have to contact your let your elected representative, your state rep, your state senator, the governor's office, um, uh, your your local state associations you have to carry that water. We cannot. Now, what we can do is serve as resource witnesses for the compact once it's actually been put in bill format, once you found a bill sponsor for it. But I just want to make sure that everybody understands that's not anything, that's not anything this board can do on its own. So talk to, talk to your, talk to your um, political arm or some of your professional agencies, talk to, um, talk to go go directly to your legislators mm -hmm. and 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 then talk to them. This is you know instead of saying why can't I, this is an opportunity for what can you do. So yeah. here, here here it is. So all right, let's move on then to agenda item seventeen: discussion and possible action regarding uh, Association of Social Work Boards Community Conversations Report. I, think, I Sarah, just wanted you... to bring this to your attention. It was um, part of ASWB's response to um, their. Uh, release of data regarding the pass rates. They um, invited individuals to express their um, their concerns, relay their experience with the exam process, and uh, they they uh, ASWB with other agencies conducted these what they called community conversations um, last spring and last summer, and they've now released a report on that. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention. I don't know that there's any particular action for this board to do. I just wanted everyone to know that it was out there for your a consideration right and and attending the aswb meetings and some of the committee meetings and understanding the process of how the exam is put together um, i've learned quite a bit about it over the last four years and one of the things that aswb is doing that you can find out about in this community conversation is they have um, committed substantial funding to research the outcomes of the exam yeah. And uh, somewhere around half a million dollars that was funding uh, some research to to dive deeper into, 
you know, looking at why certain populations may not do as well on the exam as others and look at, you know, they're, they're going as deep as looking at certain schools who have very high pass rates, certain schools who do not, and looking at how things are done because everybody has to be CSWE accredited. So, so there's that standard of those competencies, but what's happening between, yes, we meet the competencies, but here's how we provide the education. So there's, there's some, some disconnect somewhere and they're, they're really working to look into that. So feel, I feel pretty good about it. They're, they're open to looking at some other things. They're, they're changing. Uh, I think currently there are some, um, it doesn't sound like in, in the beginning, it didn't sound like much, but I, I think it's pretty meaningful now hearing more about it instead of four answers to each question. Some questions may now only come with three answers mm -hmm. and you know, it, that's, taking one of those distractors away that, that people were looking at. So, so they are looking at ways to try to improve um, your test taking experience without willing away the validity of what we're trying to do is to have folks meet some minimum standard to practice. So, all right, let's move on then. That was 17. Let's go to 18. Discussing the possible action concerning staff request for clarification whether ASWB advanced generalist exam satisfies licensure exam requirements for Texas LMSW license. Sarah sent me this, I don't know, a month or so ago, look at. And so the generalist, so, so that's the AP exam, the advanced practitioner. Um, if you look at the ASD, ASWB numbers of how many people take that exam, it, it is dismally low. Mm -hmm. um, I think in Texas, it was not over 10, was it? That Do you remember, Sarah? I, in 2017, yeah. the Texas board ceased offering the advanced practitioner license type or recognition. Okay. So Texas hasn't... We hadn't had any. In hasn't the had any of those exam types since at least 2017. We do still have a number of licensees who held the re yeah. re recognition prior to that date, and they continue to hold it unless for some reason they let it go. Um, what's so, happening is we have some people who are coming from another state, and our rule specifically requires the ASWB master's exam for the Texas LMSW license. And they're coming from another state, and they have already taken the AP exam, the advanced, advanced generalist exam, and staff is asking if they can accept the advanced generalist exam instead of making that person go back and take the ASWB master's exam. Right. I, I did reach out to ASWB to see if they had any bylaws or policies that the board should consider. I've not heard back yet. Um, I, my request was, was not timely. I didn't think of it quick enough. Um, and I did do in your meeting materials, a side-by-side -side comparison. Anything in red is something that's different. I didn't find it in another section. I'm, I'm just looking at the words that were used to describe part of the exam. I'm not looking at the exams. So I don't, I don't know how well that comparison serves you. I'm, I can only say these words match those words and these words match, but they're in a different place in the other exam. And and one of the things just historically is prior to 2017 in Texas, a, an individual would have had to have sat for the LMSW exam, then practiced under supervision, and then taken another exam to get that AP certification. Am I correct in that? I'd have to do the research on the rules. I'm, I'm pretty I'm, sure that's I think that sounds right, yeah. but I haven't looked at those rules in quite some time. So yeah, I, I'm, I has, hazard yeah. to get to Having us. worked with people in the past who, who have done that, that's the process that they went through. So my thinking on this was that if, if you, if you have passed the LMSW advanced generalist exam in another jurisdiction and want to bring that to Texas for the LMSW license, that that would be acceptable. And that's my opinion. I'm well open to discussion from anybody. And I would like to state for the new board members, as well as for uh, anyone who's listening, the, uh, the current LMSW advanced practitioner recognition is an independent non-clinical practice. Whereas the Texas LMSW practice they can practice clinical, but only in an agency setting or under or in an agency setting while under supervision. 
or they have the IPR certification. IPR is a non-clinical recognition. Yeah. So there's, there's different types of practice with social work, differentiating between clinical, which, um, AP is, was never to be clinical and, yeah. and AP was not a clinical thing. So just how that, and, and certainly someone who, who holds the LMSW advanced practitioner, the LMSW AP could under supervision in an agency setting practice clinical and then take the clinical exam. They're not barred from that. Right. I, I'm just trying to make sure that everyone understands the convoluted nature of <laughs> all these of all these things. Licensure, and you'll have asked. to assign it the weight that you deem appropriate. Any discussion? Any questions before I call for a motion? I make a motion that we accept it. We have a motion from Mr. Dollinger to accept the LMSW Advanced Journalist Exam in Texas to to allow for jurisdictional approval from another state in Texas of an LMSW uh, LMSW license. Need a second. <laughs> I second. We have a second. Ms. Andrade. Ms. Andrade. Okay. Yes. Okay. All those and in favor. Before vote. we go to that, I'd, I'd like to ask the attorneys, do we, does that require a rule change to allow staff to change it, that's to what, accept it? That's what we're looking at right now. I don't think it does. It, it would be, optimal to do a rule change but i don't think it does because the rule says you have to have passed a master's examination administered nationally by aswb both of these are master's, master's level exams. Yeah. exams administered by aswb so i think we're okay um does it say master's level exam or master's, master's exam? examination is what it says they both are do we define that's or say how do, do they do they have a specific definition for master's examination can we make a proposal for a rule change? Well, if, if we don't have to, let's, oh, let, yeah, let's, yeah. Let, let's let Patrick do his, do his thing. lawyer stuff. <laughs> it doesn't involve math, so he's yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so our attorney is looking to make sure that we're, we're within the the realm of possibility. You're looking for a definition mm -hmm. under social work rules? Yeah. I don't see anything. I don't, I don't recall one, but I'm not searching for one either. I'm, I'm not finding anything in the search. Yeah, I think we're okay. I think we can get by without a rule change now. It'd be better to... Um, It'd be cleaner to do it, but I don't think it's legally required to do it. We could do it now. We could come back later. Correct. Yes, yeah, so we could make. You, if you guys accept it, we can go ahead and begin accepting it in the in the licensing division without the rule change, and then okay. we'll come back and just clean it up later on to say it's acceptable. Okay. So we have a motion and a second to accept the the the, the rule change as stated. So all those in favor, signify by raising your right hand, saying aye. 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 So it does carry unanimously so that will that will go into a rule change and that is goes up to be heck but not on the 20th it'll be correct now we'll bring it back to you guys first first yeah yeah has, <laughs> has come from y'all first yeah okay all right but the public will be able to start benefiting from it the applicants can benefit from it now now we, yeah, yeah, we got somebody that hung, was hung up on this that's that's okay. why the issue popped up okay all right. So that brings us to agenda item 19, which is public comment. I just want to note for the board members, we have uh, three uh, written comments that were submitted. One was submitted after the um, or for the October 24th council meeting, but it appeared from the context that it was actually intended for the social work board. So um, it was included in your meeting materials today. Um, I have, we, we allow until 5 p.m. the day before a meeting for public comment to be submitted via a link on our agenda. And one of those was received um, and I forwarded that to you last evening. So uh, that's in your meeting materials as well, um, as, as well as a third one. We don't, num we don't uh, read public comment into the record. Uh, it's just there for your edification. If you'd like to include uh, the topic on a future agenda item, you can do so by letting me know today, or you can just send me an email at some other time. Um, now for public comment, um, for members of the public who wish to give public comment, 
Um, we have no one here in, in person that is a member of the public, so there won't be any comments there. If you're attending via Zoom, please use the raised hand feature so we can identify who you are. Um, I'll give, once I select you, I'll ask you to unmute. Um, the time is limited to three minutes per commenter, not per comment. Um, I ask that you do not address the board regarding a specific appeal for licensure or regarding a specific complaint, um, but any other topics under the jurisdiction of, of the board can be heard. This is not intended to be a discussion or a que question and answer session with the board. It's simply for the board to be able to receive your concerns or your perspective. And with that, I will... Let me give just a second to set up my timer. Nope, that's not it. I apologize. I'm working with a new no piece. That's not going to do. We can just have okay. Patrick. We'll keep it for you, sir. Okay. So Mariah Boone, can you unmute? You have public comment? Yes. Hello. Hi, I'm Mariah Boone. I'm the chair of the Texas Field Educators Consortium. And I just wanted to um, express our appreciation to the board. Um, the consortium uh, really appreciates the fact that the board listened to our concerns about uh, removing CEU credit for field instruction and that you are putting it back in. Um, and uh, we just really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Boone. Um, NASW Texas, you have public comment? Are you there? NASW Texas? Yes, thank you. This is Will Francis from NASW Texas. Um, appreciate the meeting today. It's always good to have the opportunity to, to see you all and nice to see you back in person. Um, just a couple of comments. One, um, I would like to make a request. Um, it's wonderful hearing we have new board members. Um, I would love if they could potentially introduce themselves and maybe give a little bit of background about who they are and where they're on the board. I, I think that in true social work fashion is a great, great way uh, to start meetings and, uh, and uh, show new faces. Um, two, just a big thank you uh, to, to uh, Sarah and Brian to coming to our conference, being there at the table, asking and answering questions, um, and being so willing to engage with the public. We always appreciate having you there, so thank you so much. Um, in regards to the rules, we very much support the BHEC rule. I think it's a lot better than this social work rule. I think this rule is confusing um, and is uh, and specifically in regards to telehealth and where the client and professional need to be located. I think we only need one board. Uh, involved. I think having multi-jurisdictions doesn't make a lot of sense. And so my recommend, hopefully the BHEC rule should move through. It looks like it is. But should it not, I would really not recommend moving this rule forward. It, it does not, in my opinion, really clear up anything. Um, wanted to say thank you about the continuing education. I think that's always important um, to recognize that field instruction does um, come with its own form of education. And then finally, I, I will continue to say this, and I hope it's received. It would be great if public comment could be opened up in the board meeting when there are sections of the rules that are being voted on. I think waiting until after the vote to give public comment just does not make sense. And if you all as a board could potentially add small public comment uh, periods to any section where you're voting on rules, then people could add their, their, their two cents. I know they have the ability to do it through the Texas Register and through writing, but again, that, that engagement during the process I think is important. So I will continue to recommend that during voting sections, we, we open it up for public comment so that people can contribute. And thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Francis. Is there anyone else who's logged in by Zoom who'd like to give public comment? I don't see any hands raised. And I don't see anyone who's attending by phone. 
So that concludes public comment. All right. Thank you, Sarah. So board members, any, any board members have any comments or any things before we move to the final agenda item of adjournment? Seeing none, hearing none, we will move to adjourn. So the meeting will be adjourned at 220. Thank you, board members. Thank y'all. Thank you, public. Yeah.